Let me introduce Steve Appleton. Steve is somebody who uh, we've known for quite a while. Um, he's been with the uh, International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership. He's somebody who has a national reputation in the United States, and he has an international reputation. Uh, he's a great resource, and so let me bring up Steve. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be amongst a group of fellow insomniacs at this early hour of the morning. Um, so as Brian said, my name is Steve Appleton. Um, I'm the president and chief executive of the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership, which is not an easy title to say at any time of the day, but particularly at this time of the day. Um, but welcome, and what I'd like to do over the next 15 minutes is just give you a little bit of an overview of the work of our organization uh, and how you can get involved in it, because WIMHL is probably one of the greatest organizations that you've not really heard very much about, and today is hopefully part of trying to change that. Somebody's helpfully left the clicker over there, so I just need to go and get it. My arms aren't that long. Um, so WIMHL was um, founded in 2003, so it's its 20th anniversary uh, this year, which we're delighted about. And the United States was a founding sponsor and member of WIMHL, which we're also really proud about. My own country, England, uh, as well as New Zealand, um, came together to form it. Um, there are now 12 investing countries and regions around the world. I'm not going to read them all out. You can um, see them there. There are around about 5,000, probably creeping up to 5,500 now, individuals who are part of our network across those different uh, countries and regions. Uh, and a number of new organizations, um, as individual organizations, have recently uh, joined us as well, which is, we're really delighted about that as well. So we're broadening our reach, uh, both in terms of countries and organizations. That just gives you a little bit of a, a picture of those that are coming through now. Um, nobody's yet invited me to go to Barbados, um, but you never know. Um, January in the UK would be a good time to invite me. Um, Belgium, Catalonia and Spain, the Czech Republic. We're doing some work with some great leaders in, in the Czech Republic, but also uh, a bit of work with colleagues from the Pacific Island nations. Uh, you see those listed there, but also with the US Pacific Island territories, and I was um, here back in March working with uh, leaders from New Zealand and making connections between uh, the New Zealand colleagues and the US Pacific Island Territories and, and hopefully going to bring them together um, early next year for some leadership developmental work. And also some work with colleagues in Ukraine uh, as part of the mental health and psychosocial support being offered to Ukrainians both in country and those that have uh, left Ukraine uh, and are living in places like the UK, uh, but also in Slovakia, and Slovakia has recently joined um, WIMHL. So our purpose, as an organization, we exist to develop and support leaders, people like yourselves, and we do that through the creation of networks, collaboratives, and partnerships. And we facilitate what we describe as rapid knowledge exchange. So information about practice, about innovations, and opportunities for problem solving. And we do that in the mental health sector, but we also do it in the area of substance use and disability as well. And we encourage and engage organizations and countries to work together to achieve high quality supports uh, for people with lived experience, both of, of mental health distress, substance use, and disability. And what we try to do is to take a, an inclusive and a collective approach to leadership development. All of you have significant responsibilities as leaders in your own states, but also within your communities. And you're working in a sector which, as we've heard over the last couple of days, is continuing to gather momentum in terms of being high on the agenda, both of the public and politicians. For the first time, probably in a generation, 
um, mental health is getting some attention, it's getting some resource, particularly here in, in the US, and I'm delighted to see that because as I travel around the world, that's not always the case at the moment. You can see that some of the things that you get if you join IMHL as an individual member, and I'll say something about that in a minute, but the usual sorts of things like an update newsletter, attendance at our leadership exchange meeting, which I'll talk about at, at the end, reports and publications, being part of a network of international leaders that you can reach out to, to ask questions and to seek information, but also to build relationships with and provide mutual peer support to one another. These jobs that you do are difficult jobs, and not many other people do them. It's a, a relatively select group of people around the world that have these sorts of responsibilities. Sometimes they're difficult, challenging, and quite lonely jobs. So knowing that there are other people out there who have a, an empathic view of how that is can be helpful uh, and talking together. I won't bore you with the structure but it, too much, but just to say that we have a couple of advisory groups that link into me and up to our board. We currently have a, a North American lead who's actually based in Canada. We have a European lead who happens to be based in the UK with me and an international disability lead. And this is a good opportunity for me also to mention our fantastic group of uh, liaisons. Now, these are people who are in each country uh, and they provide uh, a connection between us as an organization and the system it itself. And so it's also an opportunity for me to highlight the great work of our US liaison, Holly Salazar and uh, her team at the College for Behavioral Health Leadership. So thank you, Holly, for all that you do for us. So how do we do some of this work? We make the connections between individuals, groups, countries, and we encourage that peer support between leaders. And we provide the means for that fast exchange of, of information and knowledge. And we do that through a range of international collaborative groups. Most of them meet online. Um, you can see the list of topic areas. We're particularly uh, working on things to do with city and urban region population-based mental health, developments in rural mental health, children, youth and families are our focus, uh, as is um, indigenous mental health and emerging leadership. Um, we're all obviously young people here. Um, at the start of our careers. Um, but surprisingly, um, some of us will stop at some point. So where are the folks who are going to follow on and pick up the baton from the leadership that you've shown? So the sense of intergenerational learning and support by bringing through and helping to support emerging leaders so that they are prepared for the challenges, but also continue on our progressive and transformational agenda for mental health and substance use. You can see a range of other areas of work that we're involved in. Really excited about the women's leadership work, and um, that's a, a growing area for us. And we host what we call our Global Leadership Exchange event every two years. I'll say something about that at the end, but it will, a date for your diary, it will be taking place in the Netherlands uh, in 2024, in June 2024. So we don't do all this on our own, of course. We need great partners to work with. And internationally, we work with the World Health Organization and colleagues at their HQ in Geneva, uh, with WHO in Europe, uh, particularly on the work that we've been doing um, in relation to Ukraine, and also PAHO, uh, an organization called the Global Mental Health Peer Network. Some of you may know of is a, an organization entirely run uh, by peers, people with lived experience, and they provide us with a lot of great um, input. UCOMS, which is the European Community Mental Health Pro Provider Network. Mental Health Europe, which is a fantastic organization that looks at policy and innovation across Europe, works with the European uh, Commission quite a lot. LAVAR, which is a, a Pacific Island agency based in New Zealand who were over here. And also um, our good friends at the eMental Health International Collaborative and ANIL, who will be speaking um, after me. So what about our place here uh, in the United States? Well, we're really fortunate to work with a number of great partner agencies and individuals here in the US and have done pretty much since 2003. Uh, it's important for me to say that we are proud to be supported by and to work closely with leaders at SAMHSA. And that includes the Assistant Secretary as well as Dr. Anita Everett at uh, CMHS and increasingly with colleagues in the Substance Use Center as, as well. And their support, including their financial support, means that any US leader, 
working in mental health, substance use or disability, and that includes you guys, can join and participate in IIMHL at absolutely no cost. There is such a thing as a free breakfast on a Sunday. Um, if you go to our website, IIMHL.com forward slash join, just put your details in, you become a member, and then you can start participating, receiving the information and making connections. But I stress again, it's completely free for you to join. I mentioned um, Holly's work through the CBHL as our United States liaison, and that's really important because if you've got questions you want to ask, Holly's a great repository of the information, but she's also there to help make the connections to leaders across the US and internationally, and can reach out through our network of liaisons in the other countries and contacts that we have uh, around the world to get that information for you. And just some examples of the work that we've done and the innovations that we've brought here to the United States through this peer-to-peer -peer engagement and connection. Mental health first aid will be familiar to many of you. That was brought to the United States from Australia by IIMHL. Reductions in seclusion and restraint use. Innovations to support that work were brought to the United States from colleagues uh, in the Netherlands. The crisis response work, I think some of that ha that's been happening here in the US, 988, and the other work that David and colleagues at RI have been leading with many of the colleagues too, there's been a real crossover of ideas and innovation between uh, folks here in the US, but also in other countries as well. And we're delighted uh, to see that because it's such an important area of work. Population-based mental health improvement, some of the work that's been happening here in, in the US, particularly in places like Philadelphia, over recent years has flowed back towards Europe and then back in the other direction. And a lot of the work we've done here around indigenous people's leadership is really significant and is being learned from in other countries too. We're also really proud to work with Nashbid. Um, we've had a, a long and I think fruitful um, relationship with the organization. Uh, your former executive director, Bob Glover, he may be online this morning, um, he's a former chair of our board um, and um, a great advocate for our organization, as well as a great advocate for Nashbid too. But also Dr. Hepburn and other senior Nashbid staff, including Megan and Brian, who take part in a range of our work. They're con key contributors to our advisory groups in helping us to shape the work that we do and helping us to make connections with folks like yourselves in the different states. So we're most grateful uh, to Nashbid, who have also been a key partner in our leadership exchanges, uh, notably in 2019 and 2022. So the benefits of our organisation to countries and regions are that we provide a low cost and high value way to transfer knowledge rapidly between different countries, different organisations and individuals and to seek out and then to develop effective new practices and implement them at a much wider scale than would otherwise be the case. We provide opportunities and forums for leaders in our participating countries to learn from one another on this whole range of different topics. Uh, and where they live and work in an, an investing country, as I said, there's no cost to do that. The investing countries help to shape the focus of our knowledge exchange work and to ensure its value and its relevance to them. So you as contributors, Nashbid, SAMHSA and others work with us to think about the work that's going to be most important and the priorities that you need to focus on as commissioners. And as I said earlier, providing the opportunities to ask questions, gather evidence, get research material around good practice and reduce the amount of time that it takes for that good practice to be disseminated and implemented around the world. We believe that leadership is about values. And I suspect that most of you, if not all of you, uh, would agree with that statement. Otherwise, you wouldn't be leading the sorts of uh, organizations and systems that you do. But we think that values-based and values-led leadership is really critical to being successful as an organization. And so we've adopted our own leadership framework, and then we use that leadership framework in our own work, but we promote it with other organizations and individuals. And we believe that those values are really, really crucial to ensuring that you get that balance when you're working particularly with people with lived experience. 
We think leaders should be inclusive. They should be, as a pretty standard benchmark, competent. But you need to be authentic, collaborative, innovative, and visionary and strategic. Those are not easy things to be, and there isn't really a handbook for that. Nobody kind of teaches you how to do it. When you start a, a role as a leader, nobody says, well, here's the, here's the textbook, read that, it'll be fine. What you do is connect with other people who've done work like this before, who can help you problem solve and share those similar values. So we treat this framework as a, a work in progress but it underpins all that we do in our work and we share it with you and hope that it perhaps resonates a little bit. What are the benefits of international collaboration? Well, swift exchange of knowledge and learning tends to speed up the rate at which things improve. Learning together helps leaders to develop skills and competencies together. And collaboration makes those problems smaller. Two pairs of hands are maybe better than one for some things. A diversity of thought and experience can contribute to coming up with new uh, and effective solutions. And the, the key benefit, I think, is that we provide a supportive and safe environment for leaders to do this work together. Most of us, when we would stand on a podium like this, would like to talk about all the brilliant stuff we've done and how successful we've been. But actually, we learn a lot from each other by talking about the things that haven't worked, the things that haven't been successful. But we're not particularly conditioned to talk about that openly with people. So we try to provide a space where people do feel comfortable to say, we tried this. It didn't quite work out. This is why it didn't quite work out. Hopefully, you can learn from our experience and some of the mistakes we made. And that's a really fundamental part of learning and working together. What's next uh, for us as an organization? Well, we're focusing increasingly on work in relation to uh, accessibility, inclusion, and diversity, both in terms of our own organization. And one of the things that I uh, put in place when I was appointed was to establish an inclusion advisory group, which has now reported to me about the work uh, that it thinks that we should be doing, but also how we make some changes in our organization. We now have a gel uh, gender balance board, which is really, really great. Um, we're moving in the right direction around having more uh, people of colour on our board and people with lived experience. And we'll be creating a lived experience council uh, later this year, which will feed directly uh, into our board and also provide an opportunity for people with lived experience to join the board uh, in the future as part of that emerging leader and peer support process. We're going to develop our work with emerging as well as established leaders and to make sure we make those connections and to give some greater focus to addiction and substance use than we have traditionally done in the past. None of that means that we're turning away from uh, mental health. If anything, we're continuing to do more and more and being asked to do more and more. Helpfully for me, we're going to change our name fairly soon. Um, so I won't have to say International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership and be worried about messing it up, nor will I be bombarded with, is it IMHL? IMHL, double IMHL, or anything like that. We're going to change our name to Global Leadership Exchange, or GLE for short. Um, hope to launch that formally in the fall. Um, essentially, the global element is about where we want to be as a, a global organization reaching uh, an ever-increasing range of countries and individuals. Leadership is about our unique focus. No other organization internationally focus on, focuses on leadership development support in the way that we do. And finally, exchange, which is about the exchange of ideas and knowledge, but also the exchange that takes place between individuals when they uh, make connections. We're developing a, a three-year strategy from the beginning of next year, continuing to strengthen our work and our partnership with Nashbird and also uh, with SAMHSA leadership and beginning to work, hopefully, with more of you uh, across the country. So listening to what you need and understanding how we can help you. So these are the building blocks for our future state as an organization. As we move, in a sense, into the second phase of our development, we, we've turned 20, now's the time to, to move forward again. I want to say something uh, right at the end now about our leadership exchange. So we're planning the program for that exchange right now. It's going to take place uh, in Utrecht in the Netherlands uh, between the 24th and 28th of June next year. 
and we would encourage all of you uh, and your colleagues to join us and take part um, in that event and also in all our collaborative groups. The Leadership Exchange is a week-long event. Uh, the first two days are a series of what we call matches. They are deep dives into particular topics where you work and meet with a smaller number of people. And then at the end of the week, over the two days of the Thursday and the Friday, a larger network meeting, which is sort of similar to, to this sort of event. And I'm really delighted to be able to say today that uh, we'll be partnering with RI uh, and with great support from David Covington and his team. Um, really delighted about that. And they'll be uh, presenting some information during the event and they're supporting it very, very strongly as they have done in the past. So thank you, David and, and colleagues for that. We really appreciate your input into making the event the success it's going to be. So. You'll be delighted to hear that's it from me. Please join us. As I mentioned two or three times, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's consequence-free. In fact, hopefully it's um, benefit-rich. Um, we hope that you will spread the word about IIMHL or GLE as we will be, so that we become the best mental health resource organization that everybody's heard of, um, and encourage you to be part of our growing and developing social movement for leadership in mental health, substance use, and disability. Thank you very much indeed. So we're very pleased that we have an expert uh, who is very available. He's come here from various parts of the world. His headquarter is in New Zealand. And uh, for people that have traveled back and forth to New Zealand, you know it's not like going to Baltimore. It is a long hike. So uh, we're very appreciative, Anil, for the fact that you've come this far and we're really eager to hear your message. And Anil Thaplial is the Executive Director of eMental Health International Collaborative, and he goes all over the world with this message. So we are really fortunate this morning. Bring you greetings from Ayatereoa, which is the land of the long white cloud. Call it Kiura. Kiura um, in a place in a Maori world, the indigenous, uh, indigenous people of New Zealand, we call, I've been welcomed into your home. This is Fare, Fare's home. So I'll address you as my brothers and sisters, because I'm near home. So, my brothers and sisters, uh, we do not commence anything of this significance without something which we would do in New Zealand, which is bringing some uh, blessings from our chief, which is uh, called Komatwa, which is a spiritual elder. So we have Emek has a spiritual elder. His name is uh, George, and George Hill has blessed something which I would like to give it to Brian Hepburn because I'm in your fare, in your home. So please, Brian, if you could just come here before we start. And this cannot be bought. It has to be given to you. It has to be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, get a picture. Uh, So that, that act is the way you greet. That means, it's called hongi. Hongi means, I breathe the good of you and, and you breathe the good of me. So I'm bringing you the goodwill from the people of New Zealand. So even though I live in New Zealand, but my work is so global, it couldn't be any more appropriate that Steve from England, um, if you drill the hole from England, you end up in New Zealand. <laughs> so, so we are the left and right side of the world uh, from the United States. So uh, in terms of uh, my board, uh, some of the faces may be familiar to you. Charlie Curie on my board. Um, from Australia, we've got Laurie Rainsborough, uh, CEO and President of the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Michelle Rodrigue is my board chair. 
We're from England. We've got Greg Henderson. He's a former Public Health England uh, chief, uh, amazing uh, thought leader. Uh, we go from Sweden, Frederick Linden Krona, and from New Zealand, uh, Deputy Director General uh, in Ministry of Health. His name is um, Dr. Aaron Culver. So we have a range of uh, global leadership um, council as well, which sits under the uh, Board of Trustees. But just gives you an idea what we are as an organization and the kind of leadership that drives it at a governance level. I think digital mental health, mental health is such a, uh, evokes different responses. So I was uh, part of a um, two-day conclave in, uh, in uh, Nordic countries. After two days, the result was not all countries in Nordic countries agreed on the definition of e-mental health. The people have their own iterations understanding what it is and what it is not. So the widely, worldwide, widely accepted definition of e-mental health was coined by Helen Christensen at Black Dog Institute in Sydney. Mental health services and information delivered or enhanced through the internet and related technologies. That's the most widely accepted definition. I'm sure there are many others. In terms of naming conventions, depending on which country I'm in, I will hear e-mental health, digital mental health. In the United States, it's a digital therapeutics. We got e-therapy, online mental health. In some countries, it's blue prescription, internet-based interventions, online self-help, self-management. So it can mean, but it's, we are talking about the same thing. It's just like we have adapted to the different contexts in different countries. Then I would just like to say, you know, um, all of us have uh, smartphones these days. I think uh, I cannot think of a single person in this room who does not have a smartphone. Can somebody tell me, and I'm going to quote uh, uh, English research, uh, which has been published. I'm happy to share that with you as well. Can somebody tell me the number one use of the phone which you all have? Number one. Can somebody just name one thing? Sorry? Texting, you are spot on. Camera? Camera? All right, so for the first time in the world, in our living memory, we are talking about in the last 15 years, making a phone call from the phone has not made it to top 10 activities. <laughs> it is not top 10 activities. You do so many other things with it, as the one is texting, you are correct. Phone is one, news is one, social media is number four. So it's not, it, normally people say social media is number one, but texting is number one. So when we're looking at the role of uh, digital therapeutics, then you look at why some of those uh, digital mental health solutions that are being provided and they are texting based, why they are the number one utilization in the world. In terms of uh, popularity, so we're talking about, uh, there are more than 300,000, more than 300,000 digital health solutions right now available in the world. Only 29.3% of those are safe and effective. As the commissioners of care, as uh, administrators of care systems uh, in your states or in your countries, it's a nightmare to... <laughs> navigate through what are the safe and effective, what does accreditation look like, what does activation look like. Um, so we're talking about the, the scariest part is whether you have a framework to deploy it in your respective states or not. Regardless of that, five million people, five million people every single day download a digital mental health tool on their phones and are using it, five million people. But we also know only one third of those are safe. So the thing is, we cannot compete with Dr. Google. Dr. Google is going to be there. People are going to go there and just do it anyway. But the people, but the people that are uh, accessing the services which are formally commissioned by your respective states, at least we have onus and responsibility to get it right for the people. So how do we get it right by design? That is the key message here. So what does uh, uh, EMIX, uh, we call it as a kind of a, uh, as an organization, our 100% focus has been around 
implementation. So that has been another core remit. So we talk about what does a good implementation look like. Uh, so in terms of first and foremost, the core remit. So when, when I talk about the fare, which is the house. So the fare is a, a house which has got a central pillar which is holding the roof together, which is a central pillar that we def define as lived experience. So, so lived experience co-design uh, in the development and implementation. So, so we are talking about lived experience being the front and center, because if it does not work for the person with the lived experience, their families and the carers, then it does not work at all. Doesn't matter how, what RCT is telling you, what, if, if it is not working for the person with the lived experience, it does not work. So that is the front and center. Number two, we are looking at a range of countries um, going down the path of digital mental health, but in absence of policy and strategy frameworks. There is no standards there. So in absence of all of that, so there was a study which was published in JAMA, which I'm also happy to share, is they, were, they reviewed 36 digital mental health and addiction uh, treatment solutions, uh, which are commissioned by United States and by Australia. So a study looked at 36 solutions. Of the 36, 29 were selling patients' personal data for commercial gain. But at the time of procurement, that was not a question to, they didn't know there was a question to be asked. So I say, either we can experiment or get it right by design. So what does the policy strategy in digital mental health looks like? And only seven countries so far have it. So I'm just going to share a little bit more detail on that later on. And the third one is looking at evidence-based. So who says it works? Where is the data? And uh, so this is where we partner with most leading in, uh, academic institutions in the world, whether it be UCL, whether it be um, Oxford, whether it be Harvard and UCLA, because they, where their journey stops, our journey begins. <laughs> so we are not, uh, so I, actually we need all those uh, institutions which are creating impressive evidence base. The fourth one is looking at uh, workforce development. You can't just throw innovation in the sector and but how is it integrated into the care pathway so the right solutions can be uh, uh, provided to the patients uh, at the right point in time so it has some meaning and value. So the workforce development is a big one. Uh, at EMIC, we are right in the middle of developing a digital mental health academy, which is, uh, was a request from Singapore government. So, so it's, it's amazing. Uh, workforce is never factored in when people are procuring digital solutions. Uh, workforce development is never, it's afterthought. And they think, but uptake is very low. So I said, oh, out of this $10 million, how much was apportioned for the workforce development? They said, none. So, that, so we just think a memo going out or email going out is enough. No, so I think we need to think differently. A good, what an optimal activation, a good implementation look like. And the last one is industry, the role of industry, whether it be Saatchi and Saatchi, we are talking about uh, creating clinical content to, into more um, consume, com consumable by the uh, ordinary person out there. So what does it look like, whether it be AWS, whether looking at data hosting, privacy. Yeah, so the range of industry is not a out there just to make money. I think I see them as a partners in getting it right. But what does that right look like? So I always say the only way we can get make symphony is by letting each maestro play their own instrument so in equal weighting. So um, I'll just expand on that a little bit. Uh, but in terms of international strategy and policy landscape, just wanted to give you an idea. In 2012, Australia was the probably the country that was very ahead of uh, its time. They developed a uh, Department of Health, developed an e-mental health strategy. And then in 2019, they developed under the leadership of Dr. Peggy Brown, digital mental health standards for Australia. And then Canada had an e-mental health briefing paper in 2014. Then uh, uh, only recently, last year, e-mental health accreditation frameworks launched by Canada. Uh, Ireland is developing right now national digital mental health plan, and that will be that will be uh, published 
a 2024 uh, EMIC Congress in Ottawa, Canada. So I'll talk a little bit, uh, expand on that as well. New Zealand has developed a e-mental health framework, also known as Digital Mental Health and Addiction Toolkit. I don't like the name, DMAT. But uh, healthcare industry or mental health sector is, uh, you know, so, uh, so many acronyms we have around the world. In 2023, at the moment, uh, our Health New Zealand has uh, commissioned National Digital Mental Health Roadmap. So that's a big piece of work going on in New Zealand right now. In terms of uh, EMIC itself has published um, uh, ethics and law in digital mental health as a, as a position statement, which has been um, embraced by UNICEF for all their work. And of course, we have got impressive participation on development of this tool by US, um, Canada, Switzerland, India, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. So very proud of this uh, piece of work. It's available at no charge to anyone. All of you can have it. So it's on our website. You can download it. Uh, in England, it's uh, not driven centrally, but London <laughs> has a London digital mental health strategy. Uh, not the Department of Health. So it's amazing. Uh, so there are amazing leaders uh, in London Digital Mental Health Strategy. Dr. Shahz um, is uh, the leader for that. But we have in Canada, um, uh, we have, um, in terms of the provincial, so I, as you know, like in the United States, Canada is also got the provincial uh, approaches. So uh, government of Newfoundland and Labrador have done great work and also looking at um, uh, Denmark, they have established a new commission, which is commissioned by the Minister of Health, and they're looking at what does the good look like, and how can digital play an integral role in the care, uh, support, and treatment. So, so they 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 uh, got a psychiatrist, a very uh, uh, eminent psychiatrist, Dr. Murray Paldam. She's leading that, and she's the chair of that commission. Uh, and it's good to see how different countries are tackling the same uh, challenge. And then we have in Singapore, um, uh, entire ministry dedicated to digital mental health. It's called MOHT. And then we have in Scotland, establishment of the dedicated e-mental health portfolio, which has uh, been amazing. So there is a lot of work happening. Uh, so in terms of uh, countries, uh, they, they um, uh, they're noted there, uh, we work with. But also we work with a lot of uh, peak bodies, UNICEF in particular because uh, their focus is looking at low to middle income settings. And I love the use uh, of the terminology low to middle income settings. You don't need to be in a low to middle income country. You, low to middle income settings can exist in any country. <laughs> so, and then we have Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC Digital Hub for Mental Health. Uh, they're, they're headquartered out of Vancouver, but it's uh, 21 Asia Pacific economies are involved in that. So we are helping them and the World Federation of uh, Public Health Associations. So this is a document I was referring to. Uh, in terms of, um, this is a, a, a conclave uh, which we are having an expert dialogue in Geneva with UNICEF, WHO, um, and I, Mitchell, is going to be there as well, to develop a consensus on a draft set of key design principles for guidance on adolescents and youth digital mental health. I'm not too sure if Kana Enemoto is here, but Kana, uh, hi Kana. So Kana's team is supporting, and thank you so much for your support. This is a phenomenal piece of work that's going to be coming out. Um, and then the, I would just like to end my presentation with, uh, we did a survey of all the member countries, uh, asked all the ministers as to what are the top pressing issues. There is only one thing that was common in all countries, and that was recruitment and retention. That was number one pressing issue. So the next year's Congress theme is digital building capacity. It's not just a fringe innovation, so something sitting outside, but it's how, does, how does it build capacity? And 27 mental health support for all. So there was recently I was leading a summit in St. John's in Newfoundland and Labrador. And one young person, Amber Lee Roy, came along and talked about three times she was admitted to ED. And the fourth time she, at 3 a.m. in the morning on Saturday morning, she um, decided, uh, rather than um, self-harm, she decided to access a digital mental health initiative called Strongest Families. And she was uh, in the ministerial uh, sort of a meeting. She said, if it was not for that tool, 
she would not even be alive and be in that meeting speaking to that audience. So her point was, this is not about digital mental health. This is, to me, is mental health. <laughs> because this is what is available at 3 a.m. in the morning for me, otherwise. So it should not be the confines of Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So we need to think that that is important. But digital is not just on its own, but we need to say how the traditional services, impressive services that you manage, how do we marry them with digital? And this is what I call, if we get that right, some good uh, design principles are behind it, then one plus one equals 11, not two. So with that, thank you.